it's great to be here with you this morning. You can go ahead and get on your feet. We're going to be singing to God about how he fights our battles on our behalf. We can just give it to him. Happy Mother's Day. Let's sing. Lift your voice. Here we go. With all I see is the battle. You see my victory. Oh. With all I see is a mountain. You see a mountain move. And as I walk through the shadow, your love surrounds me. Nothing to fear now, for I am safe with you. So when I fight, fight on my knees, with my head lifted high, oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll sing through the night. That'll be long to you. Till from heaven you came running 
There was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets. To a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. Let's sing, praise the Father. that song I was just thinking about how every word that we're singing is true it is true what a gift what a privilege to get to sing these words and declare this truth and to stand firm because of who he is and what he's done for us what a gift hey let's turn to God in prayer together this morning and as you do that I just want to invite you to ask God to speak to you today. He's prepared a place for us, a space for us here to meet with him. And he wants to speak. He wants to move in our lives. Would you give him permission to do that today? God, we say, yes, we want you to work in our lives. We want you to move in us. And as you do that, would you also pray for a local church 
This morning we're praying for a church project and their pastor, Jason Shepherd. Would you pray that God would do the same thing there, that the people's hearts would be ready and open, that their ears would be ready and expectant to hear the word of God. Go ahead and pray for church project. Let's also pray for Finishing finishing Touch. This is a a ministry partner that gives families a home, creating a space where where maybe it was just a space before, but turning it into an actual home. Powerful work that they're doing. Would you pray for them as that they would be strengthened as they establish the kingdom of God, as they bless these families. Let's pray for Finishing Touch together. God, thank you for what you're doing here in us as a community, what you're doing across the world. We love you and we thank you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Go ahead, grab a seat. Let's turn our attention to the screens. Good morning, Faith Bridge. And happy Mother's Day. My name is Hannah Connor. And I'm Tyler Riley. We're glad you're joining us today. And if you're new here, stop by the Connection Center in the atrium after the service so that we can say hello and give you a gift to thank you for joining us. If you want to get to know us a little better, you can check out faithbridge.org slash Sunday for the latest news and to let us know you're here today. Well, as our summer plans are drawing near, we want to make sure you're aware of a class we're running together with Steve Carter. In fact, we'll let Steve tell you a little more about it himself. Hey, Faith Bridge, Steve Carter here, and I'm so excited for this year's summer study where we're gonna be walking through my latest book called Grieve, Breathe, Receive, Finding a Faith Strong Enough to Hold Us. But this summer, we're gonna gather, and the team has been hard at work taking the contents of my book and creating discussion questions and opportunity to dive deeper into the stuff that really, really matters. This isn't just gonna be a book about grief and all the hard stuff. This is gonna be a book that's gonna teach you what Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, and what it means to actually grieve with hope. I hope you'll join us. It's gonna be an incredible summer study. We're so excited to launch this class, Journey Towards Hope, featuring Steve's new book, Grieve, Breathe, Receive. If you're interested in learning more, you can do that at faithbridge.org slash study. Now we're gonna move into a time that we call giving back to God. This moment is for our members and regular attenders. It's our chance to respond to God's love with faithful generosity, giving back to Him out of the abundance He's given us. As the ushers come forward to lead us, we're gonna continue to worship through giving. And around here, we like to do that the way the Bible says, which is cheerfully. together. He is worthy of our song. He is worthy of every tribe, nation, and tongue worshiping him. He is good to us. So let's stand and worship him together. Sing this with me. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. All my days I've been held in your hand. Moment that I wake up until I lay my head, I will sing of the goodness of God. Good of God. 
all the moms. Moms of children who are still at home, who are all grown up. Moms who have outlived a son or daughter. Or moms of babies they never got to hold. Moms who raised kids all on their own. Or became a mom to someone who needed one. Moms of children who have wandered from God. Or the longing to be moms who are still waiting. God perfectly arranged each of you to the role you have today. His word recognizes you as capable, strong, praiseworthy. Everything you do makes our lives more beautiful. Happy Mother's Day. Yes, happy Mother's Day, all you beautiful mamas. So good to see you, so good to be with you this morning. We do honor you today and all you do. Mother's Day is a good day. It's good to honor moms because we're pretty awesome. <laughs> and we put up with a lot, am I right? Uh, <laughs> we nurture, we care, we hold hands with little people and shepherd them along. Sometimes... Our kid comes to us at 8 p.m. and says, I just remembered I have a huge project due tomorrow. And we don't have any supplies and we have to go to Walmart at night. Or you try a new recipe, you cook for an hour and a half, and they ask for a sandwich. <laughs> or your formerly sweet and truthful son lies to your face and you find out and scream at him in public. <laughs> or your seven-year-old comes to you just hours after giving birth to your fifth child, looks at the baby, looks at you, and says, I think there's still one in there. <laughs> but we forgive them because they're cute. Uh, I became a mom for the first time when I was 19, got married very young, had a baby 11 months later. Uh, by the time I was 24, we had four children under the age of six, and then, that's right, give me all that sympathy. <laughs> I want it all. A few years later, we had our fifth. Yes, I know how it happens. Um, but those were sweet days. They were good days. You know, there were definitely moments when I hid in the closet from my children. You say, oh, like hide and seek? No, just hide. <laughs> Couldn't, couldn't give another snack, couldn't answer another question, just needed a minute. Um, but those were sweet. They were simple days. We didn't do much. We stayed home. You know, thank God social media wasn't really a thing, so I didn't know what I wasn't doing. I couldn't compare myself to the Pinterest mom. But, uh, you know, you, you guys who bathe your kids every day, no, we did not do that. <laughs> Maybe twice a week, Matthew put on the swimsuit, got in the garden tub. I would just toss him a kid. He'd wash him, toss him back, and we'd just go through the rotation. It was good. It was crazy. But in those days when the kids were little, I didn't always have a vision of what I was doing. You know, you're kind of in the weeds when, when they're little. You're, you're keeping people alive. You're feeding. You're clothing. If you go to bed and everybody's okay, you're, it's a win. Sometimes you can't see the forest for the trees, right? And so some days, really that whole season, I didn't always have a big picture vision of what we were building, what we were doing with our family, what was really going on. And I think we all need that, right? We need a vision for our life, whether we're a mom or not. Like we need sometimes to kind of zoom out and go, wait a minute, what are we doing here? What's the goal? What's the mission? Where are we going? And so I want to talk about that. I want to talk about vision this morning. Uh, vision for motherhood, but just vision for life and for faith. So we're going to look at the book of Ephesians. We're going to read this together. If you would like to follow along in an actual Bible, our fabulous ushers are uh, sharing some right now. Just lift a hand and they'll be happy to give you one. If you don't own a Bible, you can keep it as a gift and read it. Um, but the book of Ephesians, the Apostle Paul wrote to a young church that he had helped to build. And the, the moment we're going to kind of zero in on is a big picture moment where he's kind of telling the church what Jesus did 
what he accomplished and who they are to be in light of that, how they are to live in light of that. And he was talking to a very diverse audience. He was talking to Jewish people who had grown up with the law, who had grown up hearing about God, what he was like, what his rules were. He was talking to people who had grown up as pagan false deity worshipers who knew nothing about the law or the prophets or any of that. He was, grow- he was speaking to an audience that was made up of different races, different religious backgrounds, different socioeconomic status. And so he's, he's telling them, this is who you are now. This is what God is doing, and this is who you are to be as a church. So that's where we're going to read. We're going to be in chapter 2, Ephesians chapter 2, starting in verse uh, 17. This is what it says. He came, he is Jesus, he came and preached peace to you who were far away, peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have our access in one spirit to the Father. So when you're no, you're no longer strangers and aliens, but you're fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. So he's looking at these people who are from all different kinds of backgrounds, and he's kind of getting down on their level, and you can just imagine him saying, look, you used to be these, like these stones that were just lying around the yard, disconnected, not part of anything, outsiders. But God, through Jesus, has come near. He's gathered you all up, and he's building something with you, something beautiful, something that actually is a dwelling place for God himself. So he's giving them this big vision. Jesus has come, he's rescued you, he now wants you to lock arms together, grow in community, and show the love of God to the world. And he calls them a temple. He says God is building a temple in and through you. So what was the temple? Well, in the Old Testament, a temple was a building, a structure, a literal building, and it was right in the middle of where God's people lived. It was the centerpiece of their uh, nation, of their culture. And the temple actually housed the presence of God. His presence would come, it would fall on the temple. He would speak to his people. He would say, this is who I am, this is who you are, this is how I want you to live. And they would receive from him and they would commune with him and worship happened at the temple. But the temple was meant to be this beautiful symbol and demonstration to the surrounding nations of who God was what he was like. Its, its structure and its beauty was meant to show his, his beauty, his goodness, his justice, uh, his majesty, his power. And so that's what the temple in the Old Testament was meant for. So now we fast forward to Jesus who comes and Jesus carries the very presence of God in himself to the world. And he shows the world this is what God is like. He's loving, he's kind, he's patient, he wants you to have life, he wants you to be healed. And so Jesus was sort of a living temple. And then when Jesus went back to the Father, he looked at his followers and he said, now you do the same. Now you be a temple. You lock arms together and be this thing that reflects who I am to the world. That's what we're supposed to be doing as a church. If you're exploring Christianity and you're like, what are, what are they doing? What's it about? This is it. We receive from God. We behold his beauty. We receive his gift of salvation. And then we love one another. We speak truth to one another. We reflect that to the world. And we bring that whoever wants to come in, in. So this is what Paul's telling them. Be a temple. Be a building that houses the presence of God. And I would say to you today as well, we do the same thing in our families. We do the same thing in our families. As we are growing in our faith, as we're living authentically in our faith with our kids, with our spouse, we can also become that beautiful structure that reflects who God is to the people around. And so I want to give you that vision this morning of motherhood. We are being built by God into something beautiful, and we are also builders, So first, we're being built. Every one of us is shaped by different things. 
We all experience things in our early life, influences, people, words. All of this forms us, right? It makes us who we are today. I'll tell you something that shaped me in my early life. It's silly, but true. Um, When I was 14, 15, 16, I loved to read, and I loved Christian romance novels. It's rough, but... (laughs) Uh, And I love these books. I read them all the time. The problem is, I don't think the people who wrote these books had ever actually met a man. (laughs) And so I'm reading these books and I'm like, oh, this is what marriage is like. This is what love is like. You know, it's going to be candlelit picnics every day and gifts flung at my feet and compliments, you know. So then I I marry an actual man. (laughs) And I'm like, wow, this is not the same. It was great. My husband's amazing. But it was not a Christian romance novel kind of situation because that's not real. That's not reality. But that shaped my view of love, right? It shaped my view of marriage and what that whole thing would be about. And so I had to then, when I'm confronted with reality and I realize this is false, (laughs) this is not holding up with real life, uh, and problems were caused, uh, I had to go, okay, let me throw that out and let me look at God's word and say, what is love? What is love? (laughs) Um, What is it? What is it supposed to be? And I look at, you know, 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Sure, you can have a candlelight picnic, that's awesome, but it's okay if you don't too. So, you know, I was shaped by one thing, I kind of realized it, I said, oh, let me get rid of that and let me apply truth to this reality and let God tell me. And so this is what Paul's saying. He's saying you're all coming into this church and you've all been shaped by something. And maybe you've been shaped by harmful things. You know, maybe you grew up in a household that was chaotic or abusive or hurtful. And so you come to Christ, and you, but you still have all that experience that shaped you. And so you have to go through healing and you have to go through, you know, identifying, oh, these things shape me and, and I need to be free of these and I need to be made right, line up with the truth. So Jesus calls us all to come to him as we are, but not to stay that way because he's making something new in us. So that's the first thing, we're being built. Something else about buildings is that they take a long time. Buildings take time. Uh, My dad's a builder, Uh, my brothers are builders. I grew up going to building sites and we built our own home at one point. And the funny thing is it always, always, always takes way longer than they say it will. If you've built a house, you know. They're like, oh, it'll be done in July. And you're like, of next year or what? It always takes longer than you think because there's so many things involved. There's people involved. There's tools. There's processes. There's stages of building. And it it doesn't happen quick. And sometimes we get frustrated in our life because we're like, man, I don't feel like I'm growing at all. It's just taking forever. I mean, even I've been walking with Jesus, following Jesus for almost 30 years And I still wrestle with selfishness. I still wrestle with so many things. I'm not there yet. You're not there yet. But we are being built. But give yourself grace because it takes time. It takes a long time. Another thing about buildings is they don't build themselves. Uh, Paul says you are being built together. Now this is a hard one for us moms because we can get stuff done. And we can make people get in line and do what they're supposed to do. Um, And we like control, at least, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I feel like we like control. But we have to recognize that as we are being built, uh, you know, a building doesn't build itself. There's an architect, right, who has a plan, and the building doesn't get to say, well, this is what I'm going to be. This is what I'm going to look like. God may have a plan that is very different than our plan. And that's hard, isn't it? I mean, especially when we're walking through something that we never would have chosen, if we're walking through grief, if we're walking through broken relationships, it's like, God, this is a bad plan. I don't like this plan. It's hard. But God is shaping you. He is molding you. He is building something in you. In those years when I was in my early 20s and had all these little kids, and, you know, there's a hiddenness in mothering young kids because you can't do a lot. You don't have a lot of people standing around going, good job. That, was a, that sandwich you made was amazing. You know, you don't have that. You just feel like, oh, I'm just doing the same thing every day. Nobody cares. Nobody notices. Um, 
And, I, and it exposed a lot of junk in my heart, honestly. It exposed a lot of selfishness. It exposed resentment toward God, lack of trust in him. God, this was not the plan. I had other plans. And you might say, well, you're a bad planner. Well, yes, I am. I would agree. But I would also agree that I have a loving father who has a way better plan for my life than I do. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God that he does and that he goes with us and he builds slowly, slowly, slowly. And we do go through hard things and we do have to relinquish our, our desire to take the reins and control. And we have to say, okay, God, not my will, your will. It's an exercise in trust. It's an exercise in acknowledging that, yes, we play a part, but we are not in charge. We're not in control. I love Philippians 1.6. It says, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. He who began it will complete it. We do not complete it. We can't force anything. If you're a mom, you know you can't force anybody to do anything. As hard as you may try, you can't force these people to do what they're supposed to do. You can love and influence and lead and instruct and correct and all the things, but they're still free people. And so we have to exercise that trust. We have to exercise open hands, saying, I am not the architect. I am being built. And it's a beautiful thing to be able to let go. It's hard. It's hard as moms. I mean, I remember when our firstborn went to college, and we drove away, and we left him. And it was like, wow, this is crazy. You know, you're with him every, every, every day, and then you're not. But you've got to grow him up and let him be independent. We can't keep walking around and holding their hand their whole life, right? It's our job to raise them up to be flourishing, independent people. But God will complete it. He's working on you. So there's this open-handedness in acknowledging that, yes, we are being built. But on the other hand, we are also builders. And building is intentional and it's active and it requires choices. So we're, we're builders. Now, it doesn't say it right here immediately in our text, but later on in, in Ephesians, in chapter 4, it says this. And this is when Paul is getting more practical with how do we do it? How do we look like this beautiful building that the world sees God, you know? And this is what he says. This is chapter 4, verse 15. Speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it's equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. How do we build? We speak the truth in love. We speak the truth in love. Words are powerful. And if you are a mom or a dad or really anybody with influence, you have tremendous power in your words. For good or evil, Proverbs says the power of life and death is in the tongue. So we can bless with our words or we can curse with our words. And this, I mean, we got to, this is heavy. <laughs> As a mom, you're like, oh, how much therapy are they going to need? They're going to need some because they're human. And so do you. And you probably, I mean, you know, none of us is doing it perfectly. But we do need to approach this with, with a seriousness, with, a, with a, a conviction in the words that we say. Um, my husband, Matthew, is a counselor. And he works with a lot of people, um, walking through a lot of different things. And he had this one client who... When he, he came to Matthew because he's just having all this anxiety at work and just really couldn't even hardly function. And so they did a lot of work together. And he, he realized there was something his dad had said to him as a young man. And his dad said to him, you will never be smart enough to work in the medical field. And so he heard those words. They sunk into his soul as a young person. And he said, well, I will show you. And he worked hard and he worked in the medical field, and he had a great job, and he was doing well, but he was crippled with anxiety, and he was just so haunted by those words. He always felt like an imposter. He always felt like he was too stupid for it, and, and they worked together to sort of realize, like, you, you got to reject this false, this falseness over your life. This is not true. What does God say about you? Who does God say that you are? It's his child. Embrace that truth and live into that. But words are powerful, aren't they? They shape us. 
in so many ways. In a positive way, Matthew also, who's a great encourager, he would always say this thing to our boys when they were young. He would say, you have all it takes to become a man someday. When they were little. It was cute. You know, they're like, yeah. But then... He kind of kept saying it, you know, here and there. And I remember one time Silas was like, well, you have all it takes to become a woman someday. (laughs) But, you know, it kind of became a joke. But, I mean, what he was saying is, you have what it takes. You can step into manhood. You can do well. And we wanted wanted them to believe that about themselves. So that was something we spoke over them. And there's different things, you know. And, And listen, I'm standing up here on a stage talking about Jesus I fail all the time in this. I have several kids who are older. They're in college now. You know, you go to college, you've, you've realized everything that's wrong with your family. And, you know, I mean, there have been things even lately, you know, that one of my kids will say, gosh, you know, I, I still remember you saying this and it hurt me when I was this age. And I'm just like, oh, I'm so sorry. Forgive me. That was so stupid of me to say. So we're not gonna, we're not gonna nail it. We're not gonna do it perfectly. But learn how to make it right. Learn how to apologize. So we build with words. We have tremendous power with our words. Sometimes no words are needed. The older your kids get, the more you got to be quiet sometimes. we got to pray for wisdom about that. Um, Another thing about building is that it is intentional. It's intentional. Nobody accidentally builds a beautiful building, right? It takes planning. It takes thought. There's blueprints. There's design. Now, this is hard for me because I'm not naturally a planner. I'm an artist. I like to wake up and not know what's going to happen. <laughs> but you can't really live like that when you have four kids under the age of six because the house will be burned down. <laughs> so, you know, I had to sort of start embracing planning and embracing thinking ahead. And I did learn to like it and appreciate it. I still am kind of mad about it sometimes. But... <laughs> Uh, but we learn, right, because everybody does better when there's, there's some structure, when we kind of know what to expect and we have a plan. Uh, but building is intentional. It really, it's really good. And we can be creative about the things we want to build into our kids. A lot of things we're building into them without even being intentional. It's sort of almost accidental. Like some of y'all, though, have very intentionally built into your kids a deep, deep love for Aggie culture. Or, yeah, see, they're evidence. Or for Baylor culture or UT or whatever. Yeah, there you go. But how do you build that into your kids? You take them to games, right? You buy the gear. You talk about it at home. You watch the games at home. So that they're just immersed in it and then they grow up and hopefully they love it and want to go there and you can just cry when they're graduating and everything. But... But we build these things into our kids, and we can be intentional. I think we're called to be intentional about what we're building into our kids. Uh, Something that we've tried to build into them is an awe about God, just a sense of awe in who God is. And the way we've done that is we have taken them out into nature as much as possible. We live in Houston. you got to go somewhere else. But I'm just kidding. We have great parks. Love the parks. Um, But we would take them. Almost all of our family trips are national park trips mountains, we hike, we camp, uh, because we just want them to be in it and to see how awesome God is and to see what he made and to appreciate it and to love it and to love him. So that's just one thing we've, we've tried to build into our kids. And there's, all, there's tons of ways to be creative about this. But we are builders and intentional buildings is the way to go. Another thing about being a builder is thankfully we don't have to do it alone. We're not meant to do it alone. One person, as far as I know, can't build a building. You need help. And you need many stones. A building requires many stones. When Paul writes these words to the church, he's not talking to an individual. He's talking to a collective. He's saying all of you together are being built into something beautiful and you need each other. You need one another. You need to be known by one another. You need to ask questions of one another. And so I ask you, are you known? Do you have people that you are real with about your faith, about your life, about your questions? That's why we have classes and small groups and roundtable groups, the summer study they're talking about. It's a big church, so you've got to get a smaller group where you can really be known. But we're made for that. We're made to have help to build one another up in love. I, I am part of a 
huge family. I'm one of nine kids, so I don't get any sympathy for five. But I'm one of nine, and my parents, I think, have like 27 grandchildren by now. So it's a huge, loud family. We're loud, we're opinionated, we're kind of obnoxious sometimes. But we, we get together not a lot these days. We live, you know, scattered around. But we were together recently, most all of us. And it was a situation where a gentleman was going to come be with our family. And he kind of had this reputation of being kind of grumpy. Um, I think he had had a hard life. I think he had gone through some rough things. I think he had a deficit of love in his life, honestly. But my sister's talking to me about it. And she's like, just be prepared. Sometimes he says things that are not nice and... It's going to be okay. Just, you know, we'll be nice and we'll love him and it'll be great. So he comes and he spends some time with our family. And I got to spend some time with this guy and it's an older gentleman. And I thought he was great. He was like, he just kept saying, what is going on here? Like, what is this family? I mean, partly because there were like a thousand of us. But, <laughs> but he was like, y'all love each other. Y'all like each other. Y'all help each other clean up the kitchen. And I was like, well, yeah. And he, he was just astonished by it. But when I was debriefing with my sister, I was like, I thought he was great. Like, what are you talking about? And she said, well, he's not usually. <laughs> I mean, the, she was like, I think, I think he was just stunned and moved being around a loving family because he, he didn't get to be around that much. And I think in the same way that our very imperfect, very imperfect family showed this guy something good showed this guy something beautiful. I think we're meant to do that in the church. We're not just talking about biological families here. We're talking about people locking arms together, being people, all kind of people. These people had so little in common other than Jesus, but the gospel joins people together. It transcends all of that. That's what Paul was saying. You used to categorize yourselves in all these ways, but now God's bringing you together and you just need to love each other and that will show the world who I am. Jesus said, if you love each other, that's how they'll know me. That's how they'll see that I'm real and that I want them to be part of my family too. So there's power in this community. Many stones together, joined together, making something beautiful. Now, this is where we have to be careful, moms and others, but especially moms, because we can hear a sermon like this and we can start to panic because <laughs> it's like, oh no, I've got to say all the right words and I'm going to traumatize my kid if I don't, and I've got to be intentional, and I've got to build things, and, and we can start to feel like it's all on us, and it can feel heavy. If it's all on us, it is heavy. But I want to tell you, it's not all on you. You are influential, yes, 100%. You have great responsibility in shepherding the lives of these kids and these families, but it's not all on you. It's not all on any of us, because Paul says, Jesus is the cornerstone. Now, maybe you've heard about Jesus being the cornerstone. I've heard that a lot, but when I was studying for this, I was like, I don't really know what a cornerstone is exactly. So I found a picture. This is a cornerstone. It's aptly named, don't you think? Um, a cornerstone, so we don't really use these anymore, but in the old times they built with large stones, right? So you would have the, you would have the foundation, and then in the corner, you have this stone that had to be at a right angle, and it had to be perfectly square because all the other stones would lean on it. And so you have the cornerstone, and then boop, 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 you start adding other stones, and then the walls are built. And if the cornerstone is perfect, you will have a stable building that will last thousands of years. If anything is off in the cornerstone, you won't see it immediately immediately. But after a while, the lines will start to get off. You know, like when you roll a yoga mat up and you don't line it up and it starts to go, you're like, crap, got to start over. Um, same kind of concept. And Jesus is saying, I am the cornerstone. I am the only one that can take the weight of your whole life. Lean on me. Now, I don't know if y'all do this, but I have leaned on other things. For I put the weight of my life, the the significance. How am I going to find significance? How am I going to feel valid as a person? We put it on all kinds of stuff. We put it on work. We put it on motherhood. As long as I have great kids, as long as they're choosing well, I'm good. Well, what happens when they don't? If, as long as I have a great marriage, then I'm okay. What happens when the marriage fails? 
anything that we lean the weight of our life on that is not Jesus will falter because he is the only one strong enough to hold all of us up. So we lean on him. We go to him for life. And I want to say a word because sometimes as Christian mom, Christian dad, you, you have been great parents. You've not been perfect. None of us has. But you have modeled authentic faith with your kids. You've loved them. You've shepherded them. And they have walked away from the faith. And I, I just want to tell you, I know that is so hard. And I feel the pain of that. And I want to tell you, do not heap condemnation and shame on yourself. It's not all on you. We are raising free people who get to make choices. And their story is not over. It's not over. So stay with it. Keep loving them. Keep loving Jesus. Keep being built yourself. And keep building them. It's not all on us, thankfully. So we don't have to live in fear. We don't have to be paralyzed thinking, oh no, if I make a mistake, it's going to be all over. Because Jesus is the cornerstone. And friends, all of this is possible. Because God, who has existed forever in the Trinity with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, they had a beautiful family. And they had no needs. But they wanted us. And they wanted to open the doors of their house and bring us in. They didn't say, y'all are really screwed up. I don't want to be with you. We're going to keep our good thing going. No, he came to us. When Peter talks about Jesus being the cornerstone, he says he's the cornerstone that men rejected. Jesus experienced rejection so that you could be accepted, so that I could be accepted. Jesus experienced separation from his father so that we could know the Father, so that we could be brought back. He did all of this because he loved us, because he wanted us to be a part of his family. That's what Paul is saying. God opened the doors and welcomed us in. We're no longer outsiders. We're welcomed in as children. And then he says to us, be the same kind of people who do that, who open the doors of your house, who let people in, who love, who build, who speak the truth in love. And become this beautiful thing that people look at and they see who Jesus is. That is our calling as moms. That's our calling as dads, as followers of Jesus. To be those kind of people. Maybe you're here because your mom forced you. (laughs) And thank you for that. That's sweet. And it is honoring to your mom to do that. But maybe you've never leaned on the cornerstone. Maybe you've never put your faith in Jesus and entered into that relationship. And I want to say to you today, today's a great day to do it. Jesus wants you to be part of his family. Are you looking for purpose? This is your purpose, to know him and make him known. To be part of something beautiful that's life-giving in the world, that's healing in the world. So come into his family. Be part of his family. So moms in the room, I do honor you today. I honor the sleepless nights. I honor the work. I honor the service that you give. I honor your faithfulness. I honor those who are moms of littles, who feel that hiddenness, who feel that loneliness. I honor you moms of teenagers who maybe like me lay in the bed at night and say they're going to kill me. (laughs) You're going to make it. I honor you, grandmothers. Thank you for being builders for a long time. Thank you for your faithfulness. We still need you. We still need your words and your truth. I honor you, single moms who are doing it all. You are awesome and you're beautiful. I honor those who have walked in grief related to motherhood, miscarriage or infertility or the death of a child. I see you, God sees you. I pray comfort for you today. I pray he redeems every bit of pain. But I honor you moms and I thank you for what you do. Thank you for being a builder. And I invite all of us to let Jesus build us. Let him be that solid foundation. And then lock arms together and be builders of other people. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you loved us that you have been a mother to us in so many ways. You've nurtured, you've comforted, you've supported, you've protected. 
Thank you for motherhood. Thank you for inventing it in the first place. Thank you for all the moms and everyone hearing my voice. God, I pray that you would draw us in, that you would show us who you are, that you'd empower us to be this beautiful structure of united people who love one another and who show your love to the world. I pray for those who are uh, far from you, that you would just draw them in and that they would come and receive you and be part of your family. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing in both rooms about Jesus being our cornerstone, reminding us of that truth. So let's stand up together and let's worship in both rooms. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus. is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ
can visit faithbridge.org for more information on the ministries of Faithbridge or to ask for prayer. We hope you'll join us next week as we continue making more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ who make more and stronger disciples of Jesus Christ. Have a blessed day.